Dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, it's a pleasure for me to moderate uh, this uh, new webinar organized by the EINS school based section. The webinar today will focus on the anterior clinoid process, and we have a very interesting panelist today. We have with us Sebastian Stefan Lieber, who will discuss with us uh, the anatomy. We have Professor Daniel Roy of Lausanne, who will discuss with us the guidelines in the management of anterior clinoid meningioma. Professor Marco Stadakiba from Germany will discuss with us the interests of removing the anterior clinoid, especially in meningioma, to explore the optic canal. And I hope at the end that we will have with us Sebastian Frulich to discuss with us very interesting aspect about the anterior clinoidectomy. And I would like also to remember you one very interesting event that we have with the school based section organized by Jan Frederick Corneus, 5 to 7 May this year in Dusseldorf. It's an advanced and on course in school base transcranial and endoscopic procedure. So you are welcome to attend and to register to this event organized by the EINS school base section and especially by Jan Frederic Cornelius in Dusseldorf. So, Stefan, I give you the floor and I'm sure that you will give us very interesting information as usual on the anatomy of the anterior clinoids. Please, Stefan, and thank you again to be with us. All your lectures are always extremely well animated and illustrated. Thank you, Stefan, please. Can you see this all right? Yes, it's perfect. Wonderful. Thank you very much for this, uh, for this invitation. Um, it's always a great pleasure to put this together. Um, and to present some of the anatomy, sometimes a bit difficult to leave out some of the technical aspects, but I'm positive these will be covered uh, later in this, in this webinar. So thanks again for this, for this invitation. I will be talking not about anterior clinoidectomy, but about the microsurgical anatomy of this region uh, in order to prepare some of the later talks of this uh, webinar. So we are talking about Obviously, the, the anterior clinoid, which is um, covering the, the junction between the optic canal and the superior orbital fissure, which is located also in the junction of the, of the middle and anterior fossa, which is necessary to access for proximal control for clipping of cavernous or ophthalmic aneurysms, proximal control, access to the cella, decompression of the optic nerve, uh, various indications, uh, devascularization and decompression for glenoidomanagioma, as we'll be hearing later today. Uh, so many indication. Uh, technique initially described by uh, Dolenk early in the 80s, nearly 50 years ago. This uh, obviously requires some sort of um, anterolateral corridor exposure. We uh, spoke about this in a previous webinar four weeks ago. That's why I'm showing this slide, not in order to, uh, to repeat the entire anatomy, just to, um, to draw your attention to this webinar we had on uh, 19th of January, where we covered uh, a lot of um, aspects and I just covered the extracranial um, aspect of uh, controlling the soft tissues, some of the bony anatomy, but most of my talk uh, was geared uh, about preserving um, muscular tissue, soft cranial, uh, extracranial tissue, uh, facial nerve, um, vasculature of the temporalis muscle, which is obviously um, always necessary in, in, uh, in any surgery and in particular of the terional approach and all the variations we'll be discussing in the second session um, of this mini series on, um, on the anterolateral corridor. We'll be having some sessions on, I think, uh, anterior petrosal uh, approach. We'll be having another one on uh, Meckel's cave exposure, which includes lateral wall um, peeling, middle fossa approach again. So some of my talk is uh, leaving this out and I'm just focusing on um, exposure of uh, the, the clinoid, some of the orbital apex junction, and um, as much as is required for the extracranial peeling um, of, the, of the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus, some of the cavernous sinus roof. This was one publication I showed last time, just to review this uh, in, in order, uh, in, in case some of the participants did not follow this. I've, I thought this was a, an important 
um, start for this into this mini series on on uh, anterolateral corridors. So the first one is obviously the anatomy and the technique to preserve facial function. This is um, a nice uh, anatomical and technical description of the um, fat pad dissection and the interfacial dissection. This is a, a nice review paper um, on the on the microanatomy, especially the neurovascular structure supplying the um, temporalis muscle, and eventually also the um, the technique, the retrograde dissection technique, in order to preserve these these fibers um, in um, in elevation of the temporalis muscle. So this was a uh, talk four weeks ago, which I found interesting and important, which obviously makes part of all the uh, sessions on. Uh, surgery of the middle fossa subtemporal approach, uh, FTOZ will be having next time, all these um, other basics for, for this, for this uh, surgery. Today, I will be talking about anterior clinodect, um, the anatomy of the, uh, for the anterior clinodectomy. Obviously, we're talking about the sphenoid bone and the lesser wing and the greater wing of the sphenoid bone. So we're talking about the anterior clinoid, which um, has a superior root, um, covers the optic canal medially, and extends into the, um, the, the sphenoid ridge laterally, right down here to the, um, to the region of the pterion, and is bounded inferiorly by the optic strut, which uh, separates the optic canal from the superior optal fissure. The optic strut, in turn, uh, extends medially as the, um, um, as the tubercular crest into the, um, into the pituitary fossa, or the supratubercular uh, supracellar space. This is um, some more detailed anatomy. Obviously, we're talking about um, the region of the dorsum cellae, the posterior clinoid, the anterior clinoid, the optic canal, with um, the, the canicular portion, which is covered uh, by the falciform ligament. This is the planum sphenoidale, limbus sphenoidale, the prechiasmatic sulcus, lateral tubercular crest, which is this extension um, joining medially from um, both the optic struts. Um, here, this is um, optal fissure. Down here, you have uh, the round foramen with the maximum uh, maxillary strut in between. This is uh, the anatomy you also know from, from the endoscopic approaches. This is a semi-oblique lateral view looking into the, uh, into the optic canal in the, in, in the fissure. Again, we have the optic strut, which is the inferior um, boundary, the inferior root of the anterior clinoid, and the superior root, which is formed by the lesser wing of the sphenoid, um, going medially over the optic and laterally towards the, the terion and the sphenoid ridge. This is the, um, the perspective from the, from the orbit. So you see the optic strut here, the optic, uh, the superior orbital fissure and the aspect of the uh, inferior orbital fissure and the infraorbital nerve and canal in the floor of the orbit. You have the optic strut. Um, all this is, um, this is lesser wing. Uh, the greater wing is, is forming the lateral portion of the fissure. And the fissure, in turn, we'll be seeing this later, can be divided in a superlateral, a medial, and an inferomedial um, compartment. These are the ethmoidal foramina, sometimes on the, uh, on, the, on the lateral aspect in close uh, region of the superior aspect of the superior orbital fissure. There's an orbital uh, meningeal, uh, the, rec the recurrent branch, which um, exits the orbit uh, to, uh, to, uh, to join the um, to meningeal band, which is a recurrent branch uh, of the ophthalmic artery. We'll, we'll be seeing this later. This is just the burning anatomy. This is um, stepwise uh, an interior clinoidectomy done in a, in a dry skull model. So this is, again, the same anatomy in, in, a, in, a, in a skull. We'll be taking out this interior clinoid. Again, we have the tubercular. Um, we have the limbus sphenoidale, the planum sphenoidale, the, the sphenoid ridge towards um, the terion the optic strut, tuberculum and cellae and uh, dorsum cellae and posterior clinoids. This is a lateral, um, the lateral view into the, into the pituitary fossa, again, with the dorsum cellae, the um, posterior clinoid, anterior clinoid, you see the root connecting with the body of the sphenoid. You have the optic um, canal and you have the superior optal fissure. Um, and again, the round foramen divided from the superior optal fissure by the maxillary strut. This is the, uh, the, the, the course of the carotid, uh, the cavernous portion of the carotid artery, and all these bony landmarks are obviously um, variable and um, have some, we'll see this, we'll see this later, some uh, interesting and sometimes also technically relevant uh, variation. Again, this is the orbital exposure. We have seen this already. These are the ethmoidal foramina via um, towards the greater wing. Sometimes we have a hurdle foramen, which uh, emits the uh, orbital meningeal recurrent branch of the thumb artery. Coming back now to the anterior clinoid. 
So this is the optic canal, this is the, uh, the fissure and, um, and the round foramen. And this is not, not necessarily the direction you would be drilling in surgery to expose, uh, to unroof the optic canal and to disconnect the clinoid portion, the superior root of the clinoid from the, um, from the, um, from the, uh, from the planum portion and the, uh, the, 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 the ridge of this phenoid. But this is a nice depiction of, uh, of unroofing the optic canal in order to expose the, the optic strut, which is the second, the inferior root, which connects the clinoid um, towards the body of the sphenoid bone. And this then is the disconnection, complete disconnection of the internal clinoid by disconnecting the optic strut, which is, as I just said, the inferior root of the clinoid. In, in practice, usually you would do a, an egg shelling technique. You would drill the volume inside um, and, and not do a, a one piece um, removal of the, of the clinoid. This was just an anatomical depiction to show the, um, the attachments of the clinoid towards the sphenoid bone. As I said, there is a lot of variation um, that also is relevant for, for surgery and always needs to be verified for surgery when this region is, uh, is, is um, addressed or when, this, when surgery in this region is done. There's a lot of ligaments in this region. So you have the petrolingual ligament, that's the junction between the cavernous portion or the landmark between the cavernous, uh, the petrous portion of the, current, uh, the cavernous um, the, the, the carotid artery towards the lacerum foramen, you have grubus ligament, the sphenoidal ligament, and of course you have the interclinoidal um, inter ligament between the anterior and the also um, posterior clinoidal process, and you have also um, the carotoclinoidal ligament, which um, in this specimen, this is not present, but uh, a prominent um, uh, middle clinoid process sometimes um, has this, uh, this bend. And, and, and all these ligaments obviously can calcify, they can ossify and can form osseous rings that um, prevent mobilization, prevent mobilization and, and drilling of the anterior clinoid. This is the, um, the most frequent situation with just the anterior clinoid and the optic canal, the optic strut and, uh, and um, the space between the dorsal and um, between the dorm and, um, posterior clinoid process and the anterior clinoid process. And this is one of these variation, the carotoclinoidal ring, which is formed by the fusion of the anterior clinoid and the middle clinoid process that sits medially inferior to the um, um, lateral tubercular crest and forms another ring, which encircles the carotid and prevents liberal, um, mobilization of the carotid if this is not dealt with um, cautiously. This can also cause problems in endoscopic surgery and uh, has been described from both perspectives. This is um, just an example for one of, uh, for one of these uh, findings, a 3, 3D rendering of a carotoclinoidal ring in this, in this patient. So you see the optic strut here, you see the, 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 the carotoclinoidal bony bridge on this side, and it's uh, causing a junction between these two clinoidal processes that, that um, anchor the carotid. And uh, in order to, to remove this clinoid, as we have heard, we have to mobilize the anterior root, we have to drill the inferior root. And in this, uh, in this particular case, also this bony bridge has to be taken down. There's also uh, various um, uh, stages of pneumatization of the clinoid process. Again, this is described for endoscopic and transcranial surgery. This uh, needs to be taken into account, uh, not only for preventing of CSF fistula and infection, but also for, for drilling, reconstruction, uh, morphology, sometimes uh, aneurysm, um, supraophthalmic aneurysms can, um, can protrude into the clinoid and have a similar SPM appearance. So this is a, um, a, a nice, there's various classifications and descriptions, but this is one of the many um, describing pneumatization via the optic strut, which is the inferior route of via the, um, the lateral um, margin of the sphenoid. Um, via the, um, via the, the optic um, canal as, uh, for example, seen in this specimen. As I said, this is known from endoscopy. There's no pneumatization here. There's a slight pneumatization and there's a maximum pneumatization from the endoscopic perspective. Um, this is the lateral optical carotid recess, which is the endoscopic equivalent of the optic strut. I will briefly, only briefly talking about the cavernous sinus. Most of my cavernous sinus will be covered in the peeling of the, the, the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus when it comes to the anterior pretrasectomy talk and um, access to Meckelscape, which are talks uh, I think coming up in 
two and uh, three months scheduled in this webinar. Um, and I will be focusing this only on, on a description of, um, of the roof of the cabin of science as it pertains to the troplian nerve, the of the um, ocular motor nerve, um, the roof formed by the um, by Hakubas and by Dolang's triangle. And I will come back to the uh, full description of the cabin of sinus, a lateral description, also uh, Meckel's cave and the dorsal aspect of the cabin of sinus in one of the future webinars. This obviously is a lateral view. You see the optic nerve and a clinoid process, which is still covered by dura, the carotid artery, supraophthalmic um, carotid artery, the C6 uh, segment in the Fisher's classification, the trochlear nerve, and the oculomotor nerve running into uh, its cistern formed um, in cistern here in the oculomotor triangle. And this is um, why it's important to discuss uh, the, the lateral compartment of the cavernous sinus, the confluence or the transition between cavernous sinus and orbital apex together, because the, um, the transition from roof to lateral wall is covered by the anterior, um, anterior clinoid process, but also the transition from cavernous sinus into orbital apex is covered by it. And any of these extra dural techniques at least require some um, uh, mobilization and incision of the meninger orbital bend or the um, orbital temporal uh, meningeal fold, which is um, uh, the first step of peeling the, the middle fossa and exposing the, the lateral of the cabinet sinus. Again, this will be covered in another talk, but this is just depicting uh, to depict the anatomy which is encountered here. So we have the optic nerve, we have the clonoid process, we have the, um, the ocular motor nerve, which runs into the roof of the cabinet sinus, we have the small trochlear nerve, and we have the first division of the, um, the trigeminal nerve and the six running just behind. And all of these nerves merge here into the superior optal fissure towards the orbital apex. So this is already separated by the maxillary strontia. This is already V2, the maxillary division of uh, the trigeminal nerve. Again, coming back to um, cavernous sinus in two or three months, I will be talking about this concept, which I find a very useful concept, um, less, less known, but a very useful concept which also explains the, um, or would, which probably would end the confusion that still exists about the dural layers, um, the, the composition of the dural layers um, of the cavernous sinus, what exists once you have peeled um, the, the dura propria from the middle fossa. Um, this is not the topic of my talk, but again, this will be covered in one of the future webinars. The same holds true for, for, the, for, the, uh, for the peeling of the um, orbitotemporal pastoral fold, which is uh, for the extra cranial, uh, for the extra dural exposure of the anterior clinoid, a required technique. Um, and not only the contents, but also uh, histology of, the, um, of this layer needs to be known in order to understand um, the, um, the contents of the orbital apex, the way you have to mobile or you can mobilize from, uh, from the superior orbital fissure or the, uh, one of the other middle fossa foramen. Briefly, I will only be talking about the roof of the cavernous sinus. So this is Dolings and uh, Hagupa's triangle. Um, there's a lot of classification for middle fossa triangles. These are not uh, um, um, in, in this talk. So I will begin with uh, the oculomotor triangle. This is the oculomotor nerve, which runs into the roof of the cavernous sinus. This triangle is formed by the petrolingual folds. There's a, an anterior or a lateral and a posterior or a medial um, fold, which is the extension of the free tentorial edge. And this is in, a deeper, in the deeper level um, joined by the interclinoidal ligament between the dorsum cellae, so posterior ligament here, the posterior clinoid here, and the anterior clinoid. So this is the ocular motor triangle, which is the posterior aspect of the cavernous sinus roof. This is the fourth nerve running into the transition of, of the roof and the lateral wall. Um, this is seen here in a, in a stepwise exposure of the, of the triangle. And this is uh, already um, Dolings uh, clinoidal triangle, which is, uh, which is formed by the structures, uh, essentially the clinoid, which exposes the, the loop between the cavernous C4, the clinoidal C5, and the supra uh, ophthalmic or, or pre communicating segment in the fissure classification of the, um, of the carotid artery, which corresponds. This is a partial drilling here of the, of the interior clinoid, but it corresponds with a distal dual ring and the postal, uh, proximal dual ring and it very nicely exposes uh, the, um, the entire loop of the cavernous, um, of, of the carotid um, is already um, because of the sphenoid sinus uh, posterior aspect here also. 
So that's uh, that's the only uh, I think the only figure in the original description um, in this uh, eighty three paper of uh, Dolenk. Um, we mostly cover this. These are the segments in the Fisher classification. So when we talk about clinoidectomy, we talk about cavernous portion. We talk about clinoidal portion, which is between the proximal and the distal dual ring. And we talk about the C6, the supraophthalmic or uh, pre-communicating portion of the cavernous of the um, carotid as it emerges from the distal dual ring. So this is the exposure you get. You see some of uh, some synthetic plexus here on, running on the carotid. You see the proximal dual ring, which is the form, which is the roof of the cavernous sinus. You see the clenoidal space, which is, um, I talked about this in my uh, endoscopy um, section also a few months ago, uh, formed between um, the, the roof of the cavernous sinus, the true roof of the cavernous sinus and the distal dual ring, which is an extra cavernous, an extra dural, um, mostly venous uh, space, which is covered by the clinoid um, in most cases. Um, this is before, obviously, before the clinoidectomy. Again, we see the carotid. This is um, in the meningophysial trunk. The dorsal, uh, the posterior genu of the carotid is the anterior genu. This is the clinoidal aspect, which is covered in this in this uh, specimen by uh, the clinoidal process, the distal dual ring, and the proximal dual ring. This is the uh, third nerve, which is reflected to expose the, the carotid in this perspective. Obviously, we see the superior orbital fissure exposed here, all the nerves running into the orbit pass through the superior orbital fissure. This is the, um, the maxillary strut, and this is already V2 running into the round foramen. This is uh, the same thing, just slightly superior. Again, we see the exposure of um, the, the carotid from the petrous apex um, and it, its uh, cavernous portion, clanoidal portion, supraophthalmic portion. This is um, the ophthalmic artery running um, with the optic nerve towards the optic canal. This is again proximal and dual ring, and you see the mucosa of the sphenoid sinus exposed in the specimen. Um, and again, this is a more lateral perspective. In this case, you have uh, branches of the meningeal physial trunk in the posterior genu of the carotid, and you have the infralateral trunk, which uh, gives off branches inferiorly towards the, the round and over foramen, and also usually one or two branches running uh, towards the orbital apex in this direction. Again, this is the uh, open sphenoid sinus. You see the optic nerve, uh, ophthalmic artery, all this just, we just discussed. I will briefly talk not about orbit, but about the junction of cavernous sinus and um, the, the orbital apex. As I said, this is, uh, this is um, not, a, not a separate system. That's, well, that's uh, what I like about the, the concept of the Parkinson um, uh, extradural compartment concept. It's, uh, um, it's, a, it's a widened intradural space, which emits from, from the posterior fossa um, and uh, the middle fossa, these nerves in the orbit. And when it comes to clinoidectomy, when it comes to the junction and decompression of the optic nerve, when it comes to um, accessing um, the orbital apex. This is always the region we are looking at, and this is um, all the structures running in the cavernous sinus towards the orbital apex and the superior orbital fissure. This is a review I've done uh, with uh, Juan Fernandez Miranda when I was in Pittsburgh on this, and this is some of the, um, the figures we have in this uh, in this paper. This is the uh, orbital apex on the right side. Um, most of the ocular muscle, the, the periorbital fat, and all this has been removed to expose the cranial nerves uh, running into the orbit. So you have the optic nerve still covered in his, uh, in his dura. This is the remnant of the optic strut. You have the ophthalmic artery. You have the um, portion of the cavernous uh, of the um, carotid. And of course, you have the oculomotor nerve, which is superior and inferior trunk um, running in the orbit. You have the trochlear nerve. You have V1, uh, the, the supraophthalmic uh, ophthalmic branch of, of, the, um, of the trigeminal nerve, and six running laterally towards the lateral rectus muscle. All this can be um, organized, and this is a bit con controversial, but it's a, it's a helpful um, concept to, um, to classify and to localize these, these nerves uh, when it comes to uh, superior optal fissure. As I said, we have a super lateral compartment, a medial compartment, and an inframedial compartment. These are largely uh, separated by the um, analysis of Zinn. There are some nerves, as I said, the trochlear nerve, 
the um, most branches of the, um, the um, ophthalmic branch of the, uh, V1 run outside of, uh, of this annulus optic nerve and ophthalmic artery obviously run not through the optic, uh, the superior orbital fissure, but through the uh, med um, medial compartment and the annulus of Zin um, to enter the orbit. And then we have the superior and ophthalmic veins, the inferior orbital fissure and all these other structures. It's helpful to um, understand once also to, um, to understand the position of the nerve when it comes to um, decompression of the um, optic nerve or clinolectomy, which nerves uh, are at risk for thermal injury, for direct injury, how do they course into the, into the orbit. And most of this is um, explained purely by anatomy so that the trochlear nerve runs here. It's a small nerve and has to run immediately to, to supply the superior oblique. So it has to cross um, outside of uh, the analysis of Zen has to cross onto the other side. These are the branches. Um, this is the uh, ophthalmic branch with the lacrimal branch medially, uh, laterally, and the, uh, and the split into superorbital and um, supertrochlear nerves um, new to, uh, towards the, the medial cantus. So this is um, obviously the, the risk uh, for the optic nerve directly, for the third nerve, for the th uh, fourth nerve, and the branches of the fifth nerve when it comes to drilling uh, or thermal injury. This is again depicted in this uh, split of all the muscles between cavernous sinus and <laughs> apex. This is a right, uh, a right side and we have the um, ocular motor nerve. This is depicted here, but here you can uh, easily see that there is a superior branch and an inferior branch, which uh, gives off also branches towards the ciliary ganglion. We have six running laterally to the lateral rectus. And we have, as I said before, the four crossing over externally towards the superior oblique muscle, um, supralateral, uh, supramedial. There is um, obviously a, an extradural technique, which is um, probably more frequently used in, uh, in, in skull base. Um, that's why I focus this, uh, the, the anatomy of this talk on, on this extra crane, on this extradural exposure. There is of course also an intradural technique, which is um, easier to, to depict in an anatomical way because all the structures are essentially seen and um, easily exposed. Uh, frequent technique, as I said, for, for proximal control, for vascular pathology, to clinal meningiomas, um, also for intradurally uh, various, um, various pathologies. These are only two slides to depict some of the perspective. This is a sylvian split uh, with some of the insular exposed. Obviously, you have the uh, insular branches of the, of the carotid, superior and inferior trunk, this is the, 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 the ridge of um, the sphenoid ridge, which needs to be drilled to access anterior clinoid uh, to reach a meningoorbital orbital band, and um, which can be preserved in, in most cases in the extra, uh, in the intradural technique. So this is just some of the anatomy encountered in this approach. Further down, these are now surgical perspectives. We have a temporal lobe and a frontal lobe here. Um, again, insular branches, uh, M1 segment, um, terminal segment of the carotid, optic, uh, optic nerves bilaterally, um, anterior system, recurrent uh, arteries. And this is the region of the um, anterior clinolectomy from the intradural perspective. I only put four pictures um, in this to, uh, to depict some of this basic anatomy, which is probably uh, more familiar and, and less scale uh, base oriented. Um, I always thank my teachers, friends, mentors in uh, anatomy and skull base, especially Sebastian Frilich here in Paris and my previous um, colleagues, friends, and mentors in, uh, in Pittsburgh and Stanford, where I did most of my micro-anatomy uh, work. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stefan, for uh, this very nice overview of the anatomy of this region. It's uh, highly relevant when we have the possibility to start our webinar with uh, this anatomical uh, overview before shifting to discuss more on uh, pathology. I, I highly appreciate how you highlighted uh, the variation on the anterior clinoid process. Uh, it's truly relevant when we are performing an anterior clinoidectomy because it could be associated with uh, complications. So thank you so much again, Stefan. Then we move to Lausanne and it's my pleasure to invite Roy Daniel to discuss with us the consensus statement that he initiated and was published on behalf of uh, the ANS skill based section for the surgery regarding the anterior clinoid meningomas. Please, uh, Daniel, up to you. Uh, 
Can you see my screen and can you hear me? Yes, too? perfectly. Uh, thank you, Mikhail, uh, for this invitation, and giving me this opportunity. And uh, thanks a lot to Stefan, uh, who gave a brilliant talk on the anatomy of the region. It makes the subsequent talks uh, much easier. Uh, so I'm presenting you to, to you the ENS consensus statement, uh, which was devised by a, a task force, which was set up about four years back to evolve uh, statements uh, on a consensual manner for the surgery of uh, uh, skull-based uh, tumors. So this is one of the first works uh, on clinoidal meningioma. And uh, you will find this publication, which came uh, last year, uh, and you can see the task force uh, there. This entire talk is based on uh, this consensus statement, which was, uh, which was done. Now, uh, while evolving these, uh, the consensus statement, we relied heavily on uh, our uh, case series from Lausanne, which was included into a meta-analysis of outcomes and complications of clinoidal meningioma surgery. And this publication was a few years before that, and I'll essentially show you uh, uh, experiences from our series and that also from literature. So for this publication, we looked at a large number of articles out of which, based on the inclusion criteria, we focused on 25 articles uh, with and pooled data for a total of uh, 1,200 patients. As you can see, most of them came with visual impairment and headaches. And what is important to see is that uh, there is cavernous sinus invasion in a third of the patients, and uh, almost more than half the patients had major vessel encasement. Most of these tumors are fortunately WHO grade one. And uh, you will see when we discuss the classification, MEFTI's classification, as expected, the difficult tumor, which is the grade one, uh, the gross total resection is only 12% across this large uh, series of uh, pooled patients. And grade two and grade three has much better uh, chances of having a gross total resection. If you look at the results from this pool data, visual improvement as expected is, uh, is 48%. But what's more important is that this surgery is associated with problems. So you have visual deterioration uh, in 5% uh, in of patients, vascular complications in one, a new other cranial nerve deficit in six, Mortality in the modern series is fortunately low. It's at still there. It is at 1.2%. Hydrocephalus much less. Uh, so essentially, this is a surgery that is difficult and should be viewed in, in that setting. So for the consensus, we looked at uh, several uh, important things to make surgical decisions. And one of the most important things is the classification of these tumors. And we looked at classification uh, over the years. And one of the very important classification was this classification from uh, Sami's group, uh, looking at 256 tumors. And it is a very simple one, and that's why I like it. Uh, this is group one or group two. So the group one is without cavernous sinus infiltration, and group two is with uh, cavernous sinus invasion. And as expected, the gross total resection is much less when you have cavernous sinus invasion. And what's also more important, they, they show you the region of the clinoidectomy that needs to be done if you have a larger uh, tumor. The other classification, again, an important one from Anil Nanda's group uh, uh, in the US, uh, they included other characteristics like pre-op vision, tumor volume, IC relationship, cavernous sinus extension, and also group optic canal invasion. So when you have uh, tumors that are more difficult and of a higher grade, you can see how the clinoidal clinoidectomy needs to be larger than what is for uh, tumors with a, a lower grade. But by far the most uh, uh, used uh, classification is the famous one from Osama al uh, mefti uh, many, many years back. And essentially this is what most uh, series that we saw uh, use. And so uh, to run you through this classification, you have three groups. Group one is the difficult group, and this is where a total excision becomes very, very difficult, and if tried, uh, could have disastrous complications. So essentially, the group one, you do not have an arachnoid plane between the carotid artery and the tumor, but with the optic nerve is okay, there is an arachnoid plane. Group two, you have arachnoid planes with the artery, so this, you have a much higher chance of getting an excision. And group three is uh, the small tumor that occurs inside 
uh, with a close relationship to the optic foramen. So these tumors always are small because they come to us much earlier uh, because of optic nerve involvement. Again, the carotid is not an issue usually in these cases, but the, it is intimately related to the optic nerve. Uh, the radiology for, uh, for these tumors, of course, it's quite obvious that you do need all sequences of uh, T1 and T2 images for, the, uh, for uh, looking at the, uh, the tumor. But what's more, I, want, I wanted to stress is the importance of uh, doing a CT scan for all these patients. So look at this tumor that we treated two years back. The tumor is almost entirely calcified. You can see that on the CT. And uh, this is a much, uh, I'll be showing this video later, so it's a much more difficult surgery, but you can get uh, a near total excision in these patients. So the importance of CT is to be stressed, and I think Stefan also talked about it, for two reasons. One is to look for tumor calcification, and also for other uh, uh, anatomical reasons of the anti-declinar process, whether it's hyperostosed or has pneumatization. In endocrine function, there's not much uh, discussion. These are some of the literature from the tuberculum uh, cell meningioma work. And uh, there are some people who say it is absolutely essential, but generally it's a good idea to do routine endocrinological examinations, especially for large clinoidal meningiomas uh, that uh, go very close to the, uh, to the pituitary infundibulum. Uh, is pre-op embolization necessary? It's, uh, the, the opinion is quite varied, so I, I pulled out this uh, series, uh, which did a systematic review, and it's interesting. There are 15 studies, 400 patients, but what's interesting is the complication rate associated with the embolization, it's about 12%. And what's even more important to see is that there was no major advantage that could be, could be shown. So generally as a recommendation from the ENS, uh, what we felt in our group was that uh, it should be looked at case by case, but there's no, certainly no major advantage of doing an embolization. Now, one of the important topics that uh, young people always ask is, uh, how should the surgery be done? I mean, is it through uh, a vascular, vascular surgery, aneurysm surgery perspective, or a skull-based perspective? So what is a vascular surgery perspective? And uh, this is what the first surgeries for all these tumors who had a vascular surgery perspective. We are talking about series that came 40 years back. So we should not go by the results of these series because obviously it's an old series and there are significant morbidity and also mortality in these series. But essentially this is the vascular surgery perspective involves a large sylvian fissure dissection and identify the MC and then follow it to the IC. The rationale is to keep vascular control. That means we have control of the vessels while removing the tumor piecemeal. But that's been extensively uh, challenged with the development of uh, skull-based techniques. So we looked at literature for tuberculum and uh, uh, it was, opinion was uh, divided, but uh, most of the modern series advice, uh, uh, the outcomes are better with skull-based approaches and surely for uh, clinoid, uh, the, the results will be much more skewed towards uh, skull-based uh, approaches, much more than even uh, tuberculum cell meningiomas. What, does, what do these skull-based techniques uh, evo uh, entail? So an extensive epidural work, obviously, then followed on by an anterior clinoidectomy. This expands the surgical corridor. It dramatically minimizes the brain retraction of the frontal and temporal lobes. It gives you early optic nerve decompression. It provides very early devascularization. And that's why the results of the modern series show vascular complications, which are less than 2% and mortality, which is very low. And, uh, and the extent of the sylvian fissure opening is essentially a function of uh, uh, the involvement of the bifurcation. So if the bifurcation is involved, uh, then of course the uh, sylvian fissure has to be opened, but it's opened quite late in the surgery after most of the tumor is devascularized and a lot of it is removed. And that gives you excellent control of the BIC bifurcation A1 and uh, M1 and the arteries and their branches. So this is the uh, surgery we did a few, a few weeks back. As you can see, you can get excellent results, but then you may end up leaving tumor around the uh, intercavernous sinus and around the, the distal and the proximal dural ring. So that cannot be avoided. 
so uh, should a clinardectomy be done? The answer is a yes, because now, at least in the last 20 years, it's become an integral part of the approach. It gives you early devascularization, early identification of the nerve and the ICA, and reduces uh, principally the effects of optic nerve manipulation, which is almost always necessary when these tumors are to be removed. And it also gives you proximal control of the ICA in case of an intraoperative rupture. Now, what are the limitations? You need a little more time to do this. Uh, obviously, you need the expertise to do it. There are variations of this clinardectomy, extradural, intradural, or, or hybrid. Uh, and also, the timing of this uh, is a little debatable. Uh, uh, when we looked at uh, the tuberculum uh, cell uh, evidence from clinardectomy, so should it be opened? Should uh, the optic canal be opened? Do we do it extradurally or do you do, do it intradurally? And at what time should it be done? So whatever it is, it gives rapid relief of compression of optic nerve and it alleviates uh, ischemia. So therefore it, it should be done and the canal should be opened. And definitely for Kleinert, it needs to be done. So while the, the jury is out for tuberculum, for Kleinert, there is more consensus for opening the optic canal and doing a Kleinertectomy. So I pulled out also this interesting paper that came two years back. Uh, is uh, They've put it in onto paper, the technique of a hybrid, which now many surgeons are have been doing it for many years, but not really calling it that. But it's an interesting paper that describes the the comparison between the extradural clinardectomy and intradural clinardectomy, along with the disadvantages and advantages of both. And, uh, and this, you I think I would advise you to go to this paper. And it's especially important when we look at uh, the incidence of the middle clinard process, as Stefan was saying, it's, it's not low, it's, it's quite high. So a third of patients have a middle clinard process and 5% of have of, of them have a CCF, a keratidoclinoidal foramen. So a total extradural procedure uh, is difficult uh, in these patients. And if you're doing it, you should know, you should be able to know it before the surgery. So this is where the importance of a hybrid technique comes into play. You do the optic foramen opening extradurally, drill off most of the clinard, and then if you need it, go intradurally and remove the rest of the clinard. So the optic canal opening before or after tumor debulking, again, debatable, but I would uh, instinctively, it feels better that you do it before because you can then manipulate the nerve much easier without, with, with less chances of uh, optic nerve damage. Uh, another topic that we explored was chiasmopexy in, in after removal of these tumors. So look at these uh, patients from our series. So before surgery, you had this group one meningioma completely in the cavernous sinus around the rings of the carotid. So we ended up leaving this uh, part, maybe 20% of the tumor there in place to, to be able to keep the carotid intact and its uh, branches. But the entire uh, part within the cistern, we were able to remove. Uh, and then we place a piece of fat to be able to, between the optic nerve and the residual tumor, in the cavernous sinus to be able to provide a distance, even if it is small from organs at risk. Because we do know that with radiosurgery, the, the limit for the uh, treatment for optic nerve is in the region of eight to 10 gray. Now this represents just a minority of, uh, of our series. So we looked at a five year, we had about a hundred uh, patients. Uh, combination with radiosurgery is, in, is, is only about 12% uh, of patients and they're mostly uh, clinoid tumors or petroclival tumors. So uh, the option of chiasmopexy is a valid one, especially if we are uh, looking for uh, radiosurgical treatment for the remnant. We also looked at, we are studying uh, the, the evolution of the, the chiasma, uh, the fat graft and see this patient with an optic nerve here and that's the fat graft at the end of surgery. So this is the pre-op image and look at the post-op, you can see the red arrow it shows you the fat interposition between the, between the carotid and the optic nerve. And that gives, allows you to give uh, uh, radius uh, 12 grays of uh, treatment uh, to the tumor and uh, uh, the optic nerve uh, receives much less than uh, eight grays. So, so it is quite safe. And then this is after three years, you can see that the graft is still there and uh, the vision is good. So uh, this is one, 
technique that could be used, especially if uh, radio surgery is looked at, uh, uh, is being planned. So I'll just quickly show you, I hope I have the time, but a few videos of the technique that we favor. So these patients are uh, uh, placed in this position with a good extension. Uh, a frontotemporal skin flap is created. And uh, as Stefan showed, we need to do a proper dissection so that the frontal is uh, branched, so the frontal is, is not uh, taken during the approach. The, cranio uh, the craniotomy is a basal frontotemporal craniotomy. The sphenoid ridge is uh, drilled down and uh, you take it along and you remove most of the, uh, uh, the sphenoid ridge. And then you come, uh, you will identify the superior orbital fissure. Yeah, and uh, in the, the peeling of the lateral wall of cavernous sinus, cavernous sinus is done. And uh, finally, after the clinoidectomy, the dura is opened and that gives you a very basal access uh, to the tumor. There you haven't, we haven't done any sylvian opening here. Without any serious uh, brain retraction, we can get directly to the attachment of the tumor. And that is uh, progressively detached from its attachment with coagulation and by cutting. And then the tumor is mobilized away from the brain. Of course, no coagulation of the arachnoid uh, is done. Just run this video along to a later part of the surgery. Occasionally, we have to go back extra duly to complete the clinoidectomy if necessary. Uh, in these tumors that are grade one, uh, it's better to be safe. And there you can see the tumor being uh, removed, progressively debulked. Some of these are fibrous tumors and becomes very difficult. And then you see the A1 here uh, going on to the optic nerve there. And then, then you see this residual tumor that is left within the cavernous sinus. So that tumor is better not to chase it. And uh, even our consensus showed that chasing it into the cavernous sinus is not really advisable. So sometimes you would do even a supra-brow, though I'm not a big fan of supra-brow mini craniotomy for uh, these patients, but this was a small tumor and we felt that we could uh, get away with it. And that is a small basal craniotomy that uh, is done. And then again, the clinoid is removed uh, through this approach, but not completely, it's not necessary. If you remove the, uh, the if you open up the optic foramen, that should do uh, in most cases. But uh, a near total excision of the clinoid needs to be done to open that. So once the uh, the dura is open, this approach is a little restrictive, and therefore I would not advise it for large tumors and even for small tumors. Maybe uh, it can be done in very select cases. But anyway, it gets you basal. It gets you directly to the implantation point. This is a small tumor, and their the principles are the same. You just run this along. You disconnect it off the skull base, and then you start removing it. You start seeing the carotid artery on one side and the optic nerve on the other side. Uh, important uh, tenets of the uh, approach is to not coagulate the arachnoid outside but to use the coagulation only for the disconnection of the tumor from its vascular attachment. So there you see the last part of the tumor that's uh, slowly coming out. And there you can see the dissection of the optic nerve here. Uh, and the tumor, uh, once it's disconnected and dissected off in the correct arachnoidal plane, it shouldn't be much of a problem. Now the rest of the dura, you can remove as much of the dura as possible, but then as it goes towards the distal dural ring, it's, I would just coagulate and leave it. And we have not had major recurrences uh, with this technique. So that's the third nerve here. That's a posterior clinoid process. This is the optic nerve. This is a supraclinoid carotid. So that's uh, that video. And then we go on to, this is that difficult case that I was referring to you about. Uh, in which we had uh, uh, a lady with uh, uh, ophthalmic uh, of visual problems. And then you see this black mass here, which is in the optic foramen. Uh, and so this is a meningioma that has to be done. And we know that it is going to be a difficult meningioma. So we do a, a frontotemporal craniotomy, a tyrional craniotomy, and then uh, you, you thin, thin down the orbital roof and the steps of that, you go open up uh, 
uh, that's the meningeal orbital band. You open up the superior orbital fissure. And as you go, keep on drilling and removing the superior, uh, the roof uh, of the superior orbital fissure. And then you will just shrink a little bit the dura to give you access. And then you go on to the base of the, of the, uh, of the anterior granular process. And there you could see the mucosa of the sphenoid sinus there because this is a larger uh, pneumatization. And then of course you have to focus on the optic foramen. So that's the extradural optic nerve that's been completely liberated here. And there you continue the drilling and, uh, and then you open the dura in a basal manner, the frontal and the temporal. And there directly you get on to with Hardly any retraction, you reach uh, this uh, tumor of the climate. Now, the problem we know, as we expected, is this is going to be a very difficult uh, uh, removal because the tumor cannot be decompressed uh, easily. So the regular QSAs won't work. So uh, with a tumor that's reasonably mobile, I was afraid to use the drill. And that's the plane with the, uh, the optic nerve that you saw there. And this is where you see the plane on the dist uh, of the carotid. Uh, and so you, you decompress as much as possible the tumor. And then you have to, at some point, you have to decide to cut across and remove the major part of the tumor, leaving a large bulk in, in, close to the optic nerve and the base uh, and, the, uh, uh, and the rings of the carotid. So once that is removed, then we can concentrate on this part, which is the symptomatic part of the tumor. So there you see the carotid, you see the A1 here, and uh, you remove uh, the, the, in a bimanual manner, you remove the arachnoid of uh, the tumor uh, and, and this part of the tumor is removed. So now this gives you space to attack the, the symptomatic part of the tumor. So that's the optic nerve. Now, fortunately, because of the optic foramen opening, the optic nerve you can manipulate. So without that, it will, we would have destroyed the vision. Now, how do you decompress this? So we were using micro rongers, we were using scissors, and then uh, we also got the bone bone cuser, so that helped a little bit. So, uh, and then you remove again, uh, the larger part of the residue. And there you, that gave us access, showed us the pituitary stock, and then we come to the optic foramen part. Now the optic foramen part has to be done very, very carefully. And there we are taking it off its implantation of the optic nerve dura there. So we have to be careful about coagulation also here. Indiscriminate coagulation can kill all the, the arteries uh, to the nerve. So that way we removed it and the rest of it that's going on to the cavernous sinus and, uh, and the dural rings we had to leave. And then of course we placed the fat there to make sure that we could treat the rest of it by radiosurgery. So to put it into a nutshell, these tumors are not homogeneous. You have different kinds of uh, presentations. You have presentations in which you have transosseous meningiomas on either side, into sphenoid sinus, large intradural components, bilateral ones. So they have to be, you have to make a treatment plan for every patient. So in this patient, we did the uh, regular transcranial microsurgery here. And the sphenoid sinus part we removed endoscopically. And then on the other side, we did a suprabrow mini craniotomy because we didn't want to clash with other incisions. So that was done in that way. Uh, this is something, and the rest of it, we treated with radio surgery. And so five years follow up, you see she's cured of the meningioma, uh, but we still need to continue follow up. Uh, this is what uh, we'd like to call it optimally invasive skull based surgery for large benign tumors. It seriously minimizes neurological morbidity, but of course, when you leave tumor behind anywhere in the, in the brain, uh, in the skull, you need long-term control needs to be studied because growth patterns are unpredictable and careful imaging follow-up is mandatory. But I believe this will become the standard of care as long-term results uh, emerge. So thank you very much for a patient listening and I'm open to any questions if you have them. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel, for this uh, nice overview. So it's time now to move to uh, Tubingen. It's a pleasure to welcome uh, Marco Statabikiva, who will discuss with us uh, the interest of the anterior clinoid clinoidectomy in case of uh, meningioma with uh, invasion of the optic canal. It will be surely complementary to uh, the talk of 
Roy Daniel, please, Marcos. Thank you, Mark, for these kind invitations. It's always a pleasure to participate. I guess you can see already my first slide. Yes. Okay, perfect. I guess this will be a straightforward lecture on the uh, significance of uh, anterior kinoidectomy for um, visual function uh, in cases of uh, invasion of the optic canal due to meningioma. And um, the, it's, it's very difficult to estimate how much percent of the uh, meningiomas are really located at the area of the clinoid because some tumors are small, restricted to this area, some others are larger, but it has been estimated approximately 10 to 18% of all intracranial meningiomas to be located in this area. We have seen beautiful pictures from uh, uh, Stefan uh, regarding this area. I'm not going into details here, just to mention that, of course, uh, the relationship between the anterior clinoid and the optic nerve is extremely uh, narrow. And uh, if these tumors grow in this area, they have the tendency very early to uh, invade the canal. And these will produce very early uh, visual symptoms on the patients. So that approximately 50% uh, or more of these patients will present with uh, visual deficits. Um, yes, um, at, it has been mentioned before, um, I guess today, this is uh, a clear uh, established that uh, tumors in this area, if they are operated on, they should receive not only the removal of the tumor, but also the opening of the optic canal in order to check and uh, remove eventual tumor in this area. And uh, there are these two types of clinoidectomy, epidural, intradural, and it can be also combined depending on the situation. Um, how is our procedure here in our department? If tumor is large and engulfing these structures and uh, affecting the bone, then we start with epidural clinoidectomy and afterwards we enter the dura, so we do a, a hybrid a surgery. But if the tumor is small, located uh, mostly on the area of the clinoid, then in my opinion, it's not necessary to go epidurally. Uh, we go directly interdurally and we can do the whole job uh, using a simple way. Uh, Usually we perform for these cases, a small approaches, supraorbital or frontal lateral approach. It can be called the same. And uh, this approach, of, although it looks narrow, but it will give sufficient view to all important areas um, in this region. This, uh, the skin incision can be eyebrow. I don't like very much eyeball incision, but in some patients, it's uh, useful if, um, if they don't have hair. But uh, usually we perform this um, skin flap and, and then step-by-step step, uh, the craniotomy. The advantage is that we don't interfere with, uh, with, uh, with the temporal muscle. Here, uh, one and a half video, short video on this uh, technique, large tumor, we start with the uh, epidural uh, opening of the uh, optic canal. And as soon as the canal is uh, decompressed and uh, the bone is removed, uh, we use a piece of uh, glove in order to protect the optic nerve from drilling. Then we enter the dura and start the tumor removal you see how much tumor is inside the optic canal. I will show to you in my lecture that MRI not always is uh, displacing the tumor within the canal. And uh, it's very recommendable to open the canal, even in the cases uh, MRI is not showing tumor. Then we continue the dissection 
from the base. You see, I almost don't use bipolar. Uh, the picture is a little bit red, doesn't matter. I do a lot of irrigation, but I try to avoid bipolar because I believe part of the visual deficits you may have after surgery is because of uh, thermal or heating uh, injury to the optic nerve. Then let's continue with uh, this part. I have shown part of this uh, study in another, uh, in another meeting. Uh, we have done what well, we have observed in our uh, cases that uh, not always the MRI we receive uh, from abroad, uh, this MRI is sufficient to show the infiltration of the optic canal uh, from the meningioma. Uh, so that we, we started this study 2004, we finished 2007, uh, we collected 58 patients with uh, tumors of the clinoid or paracela area. Uh, we had a follow-up from uh, at least uh, one year in these cases. And we studied the MRI pictures we received from um, another uh, departments or from uh, radiological practice. And we collected the neuroophthalmological examination of the patients and then the follow-up. So um, I would like to show to you what happened. From these 80, uh, 58 uh, patients, uh, the MRI showed in 20 cases invasion of the optic canal. In all these cases, we opened and we found the tumor. In 38 uh, cases, MRI didn't show any tumor inside the canal. Nevertheless, in half of the cases, we opened the canal and we found tumor in 17 patients. You see how, uh, how un unsafe the standard MRI was to show invasion of the optic canal uh, due to meningiomas. And uh, interesting is the, um, the results we got uh, from this study. So you see here, if the MRI was a negative and we didn't open the optic canal, um, we had deterioration of optic, uh, of the visual function 9%, 77% remained stable, and we had improvement in 14%. If the MRI was negative and we nevertheless opened the canal, uh, we had no deterioration we had 45% stabilization of visual function, and in 55%, we had improvement of the visual function. And these results were very similar to these results in which the MRI has shown the invasion, and we opened the uh, optic canal. So 0% deterioration, 46% stable, and 54% improvement. So, what shall we do? Uh, the conclusion of this first study was that the standard MRI scans was not always uh, sufficient to show the intercanalicular meningioma. Of course, you can decide to open in all cases, or you try to have a, a better a, a picture. So this is uh, the, the, the content of this second study we have performed. Uh, we got the first data from the first study, and then we started to study the patients with the high resolution MRI and uh, together with ophthalmological examinations. So uh, from 2004 to 2016, we got uh, these numbers of uh, meningiomas in general. Uh, 487 meningiomas were located at the anterior and middle fossa. We included in this study 145 patients, and uh, in 58 patients, we had standard MRI. In 87, we had high-resolution MRI. And this is the high-resolution MRI, three Tesla, with and without gadolinium, and with fat suppression, and slices of two millimeters, and neuro examination. 
So you remember the data of the first study. In all 20 cases, the M standard MRI has shown invasion of the optic canal, we found tumor. But in almost half of the cases uh, without invasion, we found tumor inside. That means standard MRI had a specificity of 100%, but a sensitivity of 54%. So when we uh, studied the patients with high resolution MRI, as I demonstrated before, so the MRI has shown invasion in 60 cases. Indeed, in 53%, we found tumor. In seven, in, in seven cases, we, we didn't found any tumor. It was a, a false positive sign. And uh, if MRI has shown no invasion and we open the canal, we found no tumor in 25 and only in two cases we found tumor. It was false negative in two cases. The specificity was 78% and sensitivity 96%. And when we do the ophthalmological examinations, we got these results. In uh, cases without tumor, inside, the visual function was intact in 24, only eight patients had deficits before surgery. And if there was tumor inside, 11 patients had no uh, visual deficits and 44% had visual deficits. That means uh, if tumor was inside the canal, in 80% of the cases, the patients had visual deficits. If there was no uh, tumor inside, in 75% of the patients had no visual deficits. That means the neuro-ophthalmological examination has a specificity of 69% and sensitivity of 85%. If you put all these data together, then you come to the conclusion that standard MRI scans they do not show always uh, the meningioma inside the canal. But fat suppression scans with, uh, with uh, thin, thin slices uh, are much more reliable to show uh, the problem, particularly associated with uh, ophthalmological examination. So this was the conclusion of this uh, nice study. It has been done here. And uh, Dr. Ebner has uh, leaded this study in our department. And I was very happy because in our uh, consensus management, um, the, the summary of the recommendation said exactly the same uh, we have found in our study, that high resolution uh, MRI is fundamental to show the, the tumor in these cases, and we recommended also uh, detailed neuro-ophthalmological examination. So with these two uh, tools, we can get uh, in the large majority of the cases, uh, the problem solved. That means uh, to show before surgery, whether there is a tumor inside the optic canal or not. But if you are in doubt, if you are not sure, it's better to open because the results will be in general better. So thank you very much. This was the conclusion of this study. Thank you so much, Marcos, for sharing with us uh, this very important, relevant uh, analysis about the optic canal invasion and how to deal with it, and focusing especially on the interest of high quality MRI. So in the meantime, Sebastian Frulich uh, join us and uh, will discuss with us now his technique on uh, extradural uh, clanoidectomy. Please, Sebastian, up to you. Your... Thank you. Thank you, Mikael. It's, uh, it's nice to see you all. Uh, hold on, I have just... Uh... Let me share my screen. Hold on. Yes, can you, can you see it? Yes. 
Yes, perfect. Not in full screen mode. Not uh, all that. Yes, it is. Perfect. The dot, but... oh. Yes. Okay, so so I will I will limit my my talk to anterior clinoidectomy. A, a lot have been said already by uh, Daniel and uh, Marcos about uh, indication and uh, and technique. So I will try to to really stay focused on uh, on technical steps on the technical step of extradural anterior clinoidectomy, which is the technique I use the most. So for the indication. I use it mainly for common sinus tumor, um, almost for all common sinus tumors. When, uh, when I need to, to, to take a tumor out, I do an anterior clinoidectomy. For some lateral wall of the common sinus, you don't necessarily need uh, to, to drill the clinoid if it's lateral wall of the common sinus tumors especially meningioma, but for most of the cavernous sinus tumor, I take the clinoid out because it gives you an access to the cavernous sinus. Clinoidal meningioma, as it was said by uh, Daniel, is, is one of the most important indication, I believe. The goal of it is uh, devascularization, uh, optic nerve decompression, and uh, proximal control of the carotid artery when, for example, the carotid artery is surrounded by the tumor uh, proximally. It's always good to have an idea of where uh, the carotid artery starts proximal to the tumor. Uh, for aneurysm, it's not so often, but uh, I will show you a case where sometimes it's, it's good to have also a clinoidectomy to have proximal control of the aneurysm and for uh, optic canal decompression, which is a little bit different because to decompress the optic canal, you don't necessarily need to take the anterior clinoid, the clinoid process out. Uh, you can leave the tip of the anterior clinoid process and do a very nice decompression of the optic canal and roofing of the optic canal. So a little bit of anatomy, but everything was said uh, by Stefan. Uh, to me, the clinoid process is made of two roots. There is a superior root, which is the roof of the optic canal here. And there is the inferior root, which is the optic strut, considering that you come from lateral. So once you have drilled this uh, uh, distal part of the lesser wing of the sphenoid, you get close to the clinoid and then the clinoid will be attached to the sphenoid by the superior wall of the optic canal and the optic strut. If you drill those, you should be able to free the tip of the clinoid process. Uh, it's important to understand that below the anterior clinoid process, you have the caverno, cavernous orbital junction, which is this continuity between the cavernous sinus and the orbital apex. It, the SOF is like a canal, but it's only through the medial part of the SOF that you can see here uh, from the back that structure are running through. On the lateral aspect of the superior orbital fissure, in fact, you don't really have structure except the orbitomeningeal artery. It's only connective tissue against the dura. This is why you can peel the dura from this lateral part of the superorbital fissure without entering, injuring the medial part of the SOF where the important structure go through. So this is a cartoon to show you the caverno orbital junction, the optic nerve going through the optic canal with the optic nerve sheath. You have here the third nerve, you have here the fourth, you have here V1 giving the frontal branch and the lacrimal branch, and you have here the muscles. This is a levator palpebra muscle. This is super rectus, lateral rectus. And the clinoid process is covering all this. So you understand that if you want to have an access to this area, drilling the clinoid process is really the door to get here or to go decompress because there is no indication to go into the caverno orbital junction. This is dissections of, uh, of this area once you have drilled the anterior clinoid process. So we are looking on the right side 
at the super aspect of the caverno orbital junction. This is the orbit here is at the anterior aspect of the cavernous sinus. And uh, here was the space where the anterior clinoid process was. What's important to visualize in this slide is that immediately below the inferior surface of the anterior clinoid process, you have nerves running below it. And it's only separated by a thin layer of periostom. So posteriorly in blue here, you have the third nerve and a little bit more anteriorly, more at the level of the base of the anterior clinoid process, you have the fourth nerve, the trochlear nerve on the frontal branch of uh, V1 that is running immediately below the clinoid process. So when you drill the clinoid process, the inferior surface of the clinoid process, you have to be careful with your drill because if you go, uh, if you drill the, the periostom, you, you can injure the nerve quite easily. And the third nerve palsy is one of the complications you can have if you don't control your drill properly. You see here below the optic nerve, you have the inferior root of the optic canal, which is uh, the optic strut. And you see that there is mucosa of the sphenoid sinus bulging. That's a way uh, for, the, for the, the air to pneumatize the clinoid process through the optic strut. But you can also have a pneumatization of the anterior clinoid process through uh, the superior route above the optic canal. If you unroof the optic canal too far medially, you can open uh, the sphenoid sinus. So this has to be carefully looked on the CT scan before doing an anterior clinoidectomy. I always look to the CT scan, thin cut, to understand the anatomy of the clinoid process before surgery to understand if there is pneumatization, how far I can drill medially above the optic nerve uh, before entering into the sphenoid sinus. Most often you can keep the mucosa uh, intact and you have to try to keep it intact, but you just, to do that, you need to be aware that there is pneumatization on where it stops. So this is a picture from a lateral view, same dissection, you see the optic nerve and you see in red the two roots of the anterior clinoid process, superior root, the roof of the optic canal, inferior root, which is the optic strut. On the posterior aspect of the optic strut, you have the internal carotid artery, the clinoidal segment of it. Uh, this is a view from above, the clinoid space, which is a space left once you have removed the anterior clinoid process. You can see how close third is from the inferior surface of the anterior clinoid process. And you can see here the clinoidal segment of the ICA between the proximal ring here on the distal ring. The proximal ring is only periostom covering the inferior wall of this uh, anterior clinoid process. The distal ring is very dura that merge with the adventitia of the vessel. And you see the trajectory running above third of the fourth nerve, trochlear nerve on V2. So in this area, towards the base of the anterior clinoid process, those nerves are also at risk at the left, when you drill the inferior surface of the anterior clinoid process. This is a closer view of the clinoidal segment of the ICA. This is why sometimes you drill the ICA because you want to have access to this segment of the ICA before the pathology, clinoidal meningioma or aneurysm. Uh, so distal dura ring, it's a thick ring of dura around the ICA and the proximal ring, which is just uh, periostom covering the bone. This is histological slice. It's a, it's a nice way to look at the anatomy because it gives you a, a different uh, perspective. You can see here the anterior clinoid process. You see how close is the wall of the ICA. This is just behind the optic strut. And here you can see how close we are from the third nerve. There is only a thin layer of periostom, a little bit of venous plexuses, and we are against the third nerve. Here, fourth and frontal branch start to run above the superior division of third. And you see here that the fourth nerve is also very close from the inferior surface of the clinoid process. And this is the optic strut. 
Here, there is no pneumatization of the optic strut, but when you have a pneumatization, these air cells from the sphenoid sinus extend here into the base of the anterior clinoid process. Uh, this is view from the orbital apex, more anteriorly. It's about the same. It shows you how close are the nails from uh, the inferior surface of the base of the anterior clinoid process. So the pneumatization already said it, two types of pneumatization from the optic strut, but also from the superior wall of the optic canal. This has to be preserved, the mucosa, if possible, if you open it, you have to close it carefully. Uh, I personally try to put a thin layer of bone wax and then a piece of pericranium. Bone wax alone is not enough. Uh, carotidoclinoid foramen. Sometimes there is a third root that attach the clinoid process to the sphenoid body. It's here a bridge between the middle clinoid process and the tip of the clinoid process, or a bridge between the posterior clinoid process and the tip of the anterior clinoid process. And if this happens, you cannot take out the tip of the clinoid. If you try to take it out, you will end up pulling out a piece of clinoid like this one with a kind of sharp hook at the end. And this sharp hook can injure the, the carotid artery when you take it out. Even if it's not attached to the tip, to the, to the middle clinoid or posterior clinoid, you always has, have to question yourself, is it absolutely necessary to take the tip of the clinoid process out, this last piece of bone? Most of the time, it's not necessary. And if it is necessary, you have to be careful when you take this last piece out, because usually the end of this piece, even if there is no bridge, there is a kind of hook like this that can injure the carotid when you pull it out. Intradural, I'm not talking about it uh, because, in fact, I am extremely rarely doing an intradural anterior clinoidectomy, but you can, you can definitely do it. Open the dura, expose the clinoid from a transylvian approach and drill it. The extradural clinoid, uh, clinoidectomy for me is because I am mostly a skull based surgeon. I reach the lesion from the dural base, so I have much more opportunity to do it extradurally than intradurally. It's, in my opinion, less retraction. You don't need to open the sedian fissure. The, the inter intradural structure are protected with the dura. But as you can see here, it's quite a limited exposure because the anterior clinoid process is here. It's very deep. Uh, between here, the orbitotemporal periostal fold, the frontal dura, and here, the super aspect of the orbit, you have the optic canal here. So drilling this is quite challenging. But hopefully, we can do something with this orbitotemporal periostal fold, which is this bridge of periostom between the periorbita and the temporal fossa dura. It's a bridge of periostom through the lateral aspect of the superorbital fissure. You remember at the beginning of my lecture, I told you that through the lateral aspect of the superorbital fissure, there is nothing that cross except the orbitomeningeal artery. So if you make an incision here of this bridge of periostom, you can enter a surgical plane. You just have to coagulate this tiny vessel here that you see, which is the orbitomeningeal artery, and then you can enter a surgical plane between the temporal fossa dura, which is covering the lateral aspect of the superorbital fissure. You can peel it. There is nothing more to cut. You can just peel off this dura from the anterior aspect of the cavernous sinus. The only thing you have to be careful here when you coagulate the orbitomeningeal artery, you have to remember that very close to it runs the lacrimal nerve. So if you are coagulating too far below the, the lateral aspect of the sphenoid ridge towards the orbit, you may injure the nerve by coagulation. And once you have incised this orbitotemporal periostal fold, then you considerably increase the space, the working space, and you expose the lateral aspect of the anterior clinoid process, which was here 
hidden in the corner between frontal dura and this orbitotemporal periostal fold. So just a, a quick slide to show you the concept again. This is the bridge of periostom between orbit and uh, temporal fossa. Uh, in red, it's a periostal layer of the temporal fossa dura. Uh, in in uh, green is uh, to, uh, dura propria. And uh, you get into the space here by drilling the lesser wing, greater wing of the sphenoid. And you expose here from uh, coming laterally the orbitotemporal periostal fold. You incise this bridge of periostom, and then you enter this cleavage plane between dura propria and uh, uh, the cavernous sinus. This is in a dissection. So here is the exposure with the orbitotemporal periostal fold. You take a knife, you incise here this fold. It's usually thick connective tissue. You can see here transparent the lacrimal nerve. So you should cut here along the lateral aspect of the ridge, not here, otherwise you will get into the orbit. And once you have cut for two or three millimeters of this thick connective tissue, you enter the cleavage plane and you can peel the dura from here, uh, the anterior aspect of the cavernous sinus. This is super ophthalmic vein, and this is probably third, so fourth is here, and V1 is here. And you can see that with this peeling, you can start to expose the lateral aspect of the clinoid process. You can expose much more the superior aspect, and you can expose here the entry point of the optic canal into, of the optic nerve into the optic canal on falciform ligament, which was difficult to expose before. So now you have the entry point of the optic nerve into the optic canal. And if you have done, for example, an FTOZ, removing the super wall of the orbit, you can also expose the exit point of the optic canal of the optic nerve into the orbit. So you have the direction. And then you start drilling. Drilling is from inside out. You start with a diamond burr. I start usually, if it's a clinoidal meningioma, the clinoid is much bigger because there is hyperostosis and uh, you need a, a, a stronger drill. Never use a cutting drill for anterior absolutely never. You can use a, a coarse diamond, which is a little bit faster. Always take the biggest drill you can because the smallest is the drill, the more difficult it is to control. So usually I start with a coarse diamond three I, I remove the bone of the clinoid staying inside and I make a, I leave a thin shell of bone over the optic nerve. Once I have identified the optic nerve, I do my unroofing of the optic canal. And once you reach the optic canal, you have to switch from a coarse diamond to a pure diamond with a lot of irrigation. Remember that every time you see that the bones start to be white or, or worse, start to be brown because there is not enough water. The temperature deep is more than 100 degrees. So in a less than a second, your optic nerve can be burned. So it needs absolutely continuous irrigation. So once you have unroofed your optic nerve, you have removed the superior root. You have cut the superior root of the optic of the anterior clinoid process. Then you focus here inside the clinoid to drill the inferior root of the anterior clinoid process. And here in red is the last and deepest part of the superior root. That's where usually I move to a two millimeter diamond because this piece of bone is small. And this is the last attachment of the clinoid to the superior root. And at the end, once you have a uh, section, drill the superior root and roof optic strut completely, your clinoid start to be mobile. If it's not mobile, then it means that you have a third root. It's still attached to the middle clinoid process or posterior clinoid process. And then you have to question yourself. Should I insist trying to take it out or not? You should, in most cases, leave it behind. 
Because remember also that the reason why you did an anterior clinoidectomy is most often to open the optic canal and this is already, be, already done. So about the drill, again, never use cutting burr use diamond burr, eventually three cores when you start and you have a big volume of bone. The shaft of the drill is dangerous. So this is why those new types of drill where uh, the shaft is completely covered until the tip with integrated irrigation is probably one of the best uh, drill uh, to do those kind of, uh, of maneuver. So the complication you can have, you can injure the optic nerve with the drill or with temperature. You can injure the oculomotor nerve running just below, trochlear nerve running just below a little bit more, more anterior. Obviously, you can get into the carotid if you're not careful enough. That's why cutting burr, cutting burr or coarse burr should be avoided when you get close to the carotid. <coughs> and you can have a CSF leakage if you open the sphenoid sinus and you don't close it. So I show you a few videos. I think this was a clinoidal meningioma. Here we are on the left side. I am cutting here the orbitotemporal periostal fold. Uh, you see that the, the lateral aspect of the sphenoid uh, of the superorbital fissure is very narrow. It's probably because of hyperostosis. And progressively, I enter this surgical plane, uh, peeling the dura from the anterior aspect of the cavernous sinus. It's a bloody bone, so probably uh, hyperostosis. Uh, in those cases, you don't have cancellous bone. It's only hard on the strong bone. You have to peel the dura from <coughs> the superior wall of the orbit also to allow a better retraction of the dura. And progressively, you drill. If it's a big anterior clinoid process, it can be painful. It takes time. Uh, to, to take all this uh, hard bone out. And progressively, you start to see uh, the anterior, uh, the optic canal. It's, uh, it's probably here. And, uh, and uh, again, progressively, you take, uh, you take the bone out. Uh, I am completely lost here. I don't know where I am. I think it's uh, foramen rotundum and foramen ovale. Uh, yes, I am, I am back here in the, in the anterior clinoid process. Yes. Okay. So this is the anterior clinoidectomy. Uh, I am drilling here towards the optic nerve and, uh, and to, uh, trying to have an idea of the direction of the optic nerve. You see here, medially, this is a uh, uh, mucosa of the sphenoid sinus. And here I start to see the optic canal. I start to see the shape of the optic canal. I have a pure uh, diamond and under continuous irrigation, it's not only drops, it's really continuous irrigation. Uh, so here I am working on the base, inferior surface of the client process on the base. Uh, this is, uh, I leave a thin shell of bone that I take out with, uh, with a ranger. Uh, it's a little bit bloody on the depths, typical of clinoidal meningioma, but this is also why you drill it because we are going to devascularize here uh, the meningioma uh, taking the clinoid process out. You see that the bone is infiltrated by the tumor. Uh, I am already taking out here uh, meningioma. Uh, so here, there is no real question of tip because usually the tip is already eaten by the tumor. But here I am a little bit increasing here the opening of the optic canal, drilling a little bit more superiorly and posteriorly to have a nice decompression. I absolutely agree with Marcos Tatajiba saying that there is almost always infiltration of the optic canal in those tumors. It's just a question of looking for it with the MRI or during the surgery. Uh, this was a case of, uh, of clinoidal meningioma. I think I will skip the video. Typical case where it's interesting to take the clinoid process out because you see that the carotid is inside here. So drilling this piece of bone will give me an access to the proximal segment of the ICA before it enters the tumor. And it will also devascularize because you see that all the vessels 
<coughs> feeders are coming from the clinoid process. So if I join the clinoid process, I have devascularized most of it. I will show you here a case where it's also useful for this giant uh, aneurysm. Here it was a carotid aneurysm. This patient was almost blind um, and because of this aneurysm. So coiling was not an option. I am not an Ayatollah of vascular anymore in, uh, in, in France, because as you know, we have a limited indication, but this I think was, was a good case. The goal was to decompress, to trap the aneurysm, to stop the flow inside and to see this aneurysm shrink with time. And this is what happened. So uh, I start here with a bypass uh, because uh, I was worried of, uh, of, uh, of not enough flow. We did a balloon test occlusion and it was below two second delay. So I, pre I scheduled for a bypass. We did an FTOZ approach. It's a perfect approach to give you the amount of exposure you need here to drill the clinoid, but also to trap uh, eventually more proximal than the clinoid uh, segment of this ICA, which was a Petrus ICA. I was not completely sure that I would be able to put a clip on the clinoidal segment of the ICA. And it's, a, it's a, as a matter of fact, this is what happened. I was not able to clip on the clinoidal segment of the ICA. So here I am drilling the bone uh, to get towards uh, the clinoid process. Here I am peeling the dura from the anterior aspect of the cavernous sinus, and I start here the anterior clinoidectomy. And roofing the optic canal, I wanted to unroof the optic canal to give some freedom to the optic nerve before working on the aneurysis because this patient was almost blind. The goal was to save vision, not necessarily to treat the aneurysis because of rupture. It was just a question of vision. I am taking the tip out and here is the clinoidal segment of the ICA. It's too big. I cannot put a clip here. It's already the beginning of the aneurysis. So I try, but it was too big and I was scared putting a clip to create a rupture. So here, I thought uh, first I do the bypass. Uh, I am here uh, opening the sylvian fissure. And you will see something very interesting here. This is falciform ligament. Falciform ligament is the cause of the compression of the optic nerve. It's not the aneurysis. It's because the aneurysis is pushing falciform ligament on, uh, against the nerve. I am having here distal control of the ICA. Uh, uh, distal to the aneurysm, and I am looking for anterior choroidal to put the clip the uh, proximal to anterior choroidal. And this is a nice thing. I am cutting here falciform ligament, and you see the print of falciform ligament on the optic nerve. I even questioned myself, maybe I should stop here and not doing anything else, just to save vision and we, we treat and we coil the aneurysis. This would have been an option but I already prepared everything. So I did the bypass, uh, nothing special about it. Uh, it's a STA, MCA bypass, uh, classic one uh, to be sure I have enough flow. And then I still need my proximal control. So I am looking for a Glasscock triangle. This is GSPN. I am lateral to Kawase. I am drilling here the carotid canal. Uh, this is a uh, tensor tympani muscle. A stachian tube is a little bit lateral. And here I expose the carotid artery. So this was uh, the only way for me to clip the aneurysis proximal, uh, proximal. I had an issue is that I still had a little bit of filing after the surgery because of the median artery. But uh, after a few weeks, it stopped, and when we did an MRI at three months, the aneurysis completely shrink, <coughs> and vision completely improved. This patient is seeing almost normally now. And this is a distal clip here on, uh, on, the, on the carotid artery, just distal to the aneurysis. I'm not getting into the aneurysis. I'm just trapping the aneurysis, that's it. I don't need to do anything more. So that's it. This was a post-operative scan with the bypass and, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and the angio. So when you do an anterior clinoidectomy, first question, when you are planning it, do I really need it? It's a dangerous step. 
it's something you put structure at risk. So it's not something you just do because you want to follow uh, the article on chapters you have read on cabinet sinus surgery. You do it because you need it. Should I do a complete or incomplete clinoidectomy? Sometimes you just need to decompress the optic canal. So you decompress and you stop here. Should I do it intra or extra dual? Should I peel the lateral wall of the cabinet sinus to increase the exposure? If you are running after a cabinet sinus tumor, well, peeling is the first step. So start with this step, unless then you will considerably increase the exposure of uh, the clinoid process to make it much safer uh, for the anterior clinoidectomy. Thank you very much. Sorry for being too long. Thank you so much, uh, Sebastian, for sharing with us your technical aspect and uh, your wonderful cases. Uh, I think during this uh, webinar, we, we highlight the different modalities, uh, the different possibilities to, to deal with uh, anterior clinoid meningiomas. Very interesting and complimentary webinar when we were listening to all your talks. Regarding the, just one question, regarding the complication rate when you are dealing with an anterior clinoid meningioma, are you uh, trying to get a proximal control by sample, at least by draping the cervical area? Of course, uh, you can have a, a petrous carotid control, but uh, it will take time to get this control. So when you approach an anterior clinoid, do you drape the cervical area? One thing that I do usually, I would say. Me, me never. I have to say I have never done that. Uh, I don't know if Daniel is doing it. No, no, no. I, I don't do it either. Just a precaution in case of, because uh, I'm sure that uh, living with a uh, carotid injury during the surgery will be <laughs> a very big trouble. So uh, it's maybe a, a cautious uh, maneuver. <laughs> Just one, one remark. But you are maybe not uh, uh, afraid of this complication. But I, I think, think it's. It could I happen. think you're. I think you're right. It's better to do it if you feel that you are at risk. And uh, if you start with an anterior clinoidectomy for a difficult case, I think it's a good point uh, to to have this proximal control if you're not completely sure of yourself. It's uh, so always better to have it in case of. Yes, it is just a, mo a small point. But if it is not draped. I, I stress that uh, you can be a very bad situation. And while it is straight, you have still time to, to compress the cervical carotid artery and to dissect the neck. Just one small tip and tricks. <laughs> <coughs> is there any, anything else that you would like to ask or, or share with you, with, with us? No, nothing special, I think we... We cover many aspects uh, on uh, on this procedure, from the anatomy to the technical aspects. Marcos, anything else to to say to us? Are you still with us or not? Or oh, Daniel? No, nothing much from my side. I think we have covered this topic extensively. Yes, it was extensive. Uh, uh, I think we also answered the the. The question uh, given by the audience. Uh, one one of the question is uh, at which at which time of your training you can start this procedure. I, I think it's more an expert uh, procedure, and uh, maybe it's uh, later in your training that you should do that when you are probably follow and uh, don't know what is your your vision about that, but. Uh, I think it's quite a complex procedure that can be associated with uh, a lot of complication, devastating complications, so it has to be done properly. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, if there is an in-house uh, cadaver facility, then uh, fellows get into it much uh, easier, and that's what's happening in Lausanne. So because we have a cadaver facility, all of them, uh, the senior uh, postgraduates are uh, use that to get trained and then they get into it uh, during their fellowship years, the Kleiner Dectomy. So uh, I think we will uh, end up the webinar now. It will be my pleasure to, to see all of you in uh, four weeks. And the next topic will focus on uh, the orbitozygomatic approach that is uh, complementary. Sebastian already showed uh, 
uh, a video and where it was performed, but uh, we will more discuss the technical aspect uh, during the next webinar. It will be a pleasure to be with you. It's in, uh, in one month. So thank, thank you so you very much, much Michael. Thanks. Very uh, nice. Very, very nice. Very interesting talks, and it will be a pleasure to see you very soon. Okay. Daniel, bye bye. Lorenzo, bye bye. I see Hello. you even. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye to everybody. See you, see you bye -bye. next time. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.